Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Distinguished delegates, indigenous people's representatives, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to present today my third annual report to the General Assembly. I would like to start by expressing my gratitude to the numerous states, indigenous peoples, and others, in particular the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, for the support they have provided me, uh, provided as I have entered and carried out my mandate. Over the past year, I have engaged in a range of activities within my mandate. The various activities have, like, I have carried out can be described as falling within four interrelated areas of work. I undertake thematic studies, conduct country visits, promote good practices, and address communications to governments on alleged cases of human rights violations. In this presentation to the General Assembly, I will focus on my thematic, thematic work and refer to my three country visit reports from the past years. In my thematic report, which I am presenting to the General Assembly today, it's contained in A-71-229, I have chosen to explore how conservation measures affect indigenous peoples. While protected areas for conservation have the potential of safeguarding the biodiversity for the benefit of all humanity, these have also frequently been associated with human rights violations against indigenous peoples in many parts of the world. The establishment of national parks and conservation areas has result, have resulted in serious and systematic violations of indigenous peoples' rights through expropriation of their traditional lands and territories, forced displacement, and killings of their community members, non-recognition of their authorities, denial of access to livelihood activities and spiritual sites, and the subsequent loss of their culture. Indigenous peoples who have been evicted from their traditional lands suffer marginalization and poverty and are commonly excluded from redress mechanisms and reparation for the harm they have endured. I deeply regret that as I continue to receive complaints about violations against the rights of indigenous peoples in the name of conservation. In my report, I charted the favorable legal developments as well as the commitments and resolutions taken to advance a human rights-based approach to conservation. I have, however, I have found that practical implementation and advancement of this human rights-based approach remains sorely lacking. The report presents recommendations on how indigenous people's rights can be better protected in conservation policy and practice. Madam Chair, traditional indigenous territories encompass around 22% of the world's land surface and they coincide with areas that hold 80% of the planet's biodiversity. There is increasing recognition that ancestral lands of indigenous peoples contain the most intact ecosystems and provide the most effective and sustainable form of conservation. Past conservation practices were characterized by the failure to consult with indigenous peoples when government authorities decided to declare protected areas. Government decisions to declare areas protected were motivated not only by an interest to protect nature, but also to promote tourism to such areas. The traditional lands of indigenous peoples are being declared protected for the purposes of conservation at a rapidly increasing rate. Current estimates indicate that 50% of protected areas worldwide have been established on lands traditionally occupied and used by indigenous peoples. And in some regions, this territorial overlap is higher, such as in Central America, where it reaches around 90%. <clears throat> Excuse me. In this regard, it is important to underline that studies have demonstrated that the territories of indigenous peoples who have been given land rights have been significantly better conserved and protected against deforestation than the adjacent lands. In practice, however, the in, for indigenous peoples, the consequences of declaration of protected areas commonly entailed expropriation of their traditional territories and loss of land rights, as well as their exclusion from management and territorial governance. 
the loss of guardianship of indigenous peoples has often placed their lands under the control of government authorities who have lacked the capacity and political will to protect the land effectively. It is particularly disconcerting that in many countries where indigenous have not peoples have not been awarded land rights over their traditional territories, there are increasing incursions of extractive industries, agribusiness expansion, and mega infrastructure development, even inside protected areas. Madam Chair, while there is an increasing evidence that indigenous peoples' traditional lands and territories hold highly preserved ecosystems and biodiversity rates, the important role played by indigenous peoples as environmental guardians still fails to gain due recognition. According to the United Nations Environment Program World Conservation Monitoring Center, in 2014, only less than 5% of protected areas worldwide are governed by indigenous peoples and local communities. Under international human rights law, indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination, land rights, and to participate in decisions affecting them, such as the establishment and management of protected areas. States should recognize and protect the rights of indigenous peoples to own, develop, control and use their communal lands and to participate in the management and conservation of the associated natural resources. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which consolidates the individual and collective rights of indigenous peoples already recognized in other human rights instruments and jurisprudence, affirms the right of indigenous peoples to own and control their lands <coughs> and makes specific reference to conservation in Article 29, which states that indigenous peoples have the right to conservation and protection of the environment and the productive capacity of their lands or territories and resources, and that states shall establish and implement assistance programs for indigenous peoples for such conservation and protection without discrimination. The Declaration, furthermore, affirms in Article 32 that indigenous peoples have the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for the development or use of their lands or territories and other resources, and that states shall cooperate in good faith with indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free prior and informed consent prior to approval of any project affecting their lands or territories and other resources. Under international environmental law, all 196 states parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity have agreed that the establishment, management, and monitoring of protected areas should take place with the full and effective participation of and full respect for the rights of indigenous peoples. They have also set targets which include global expansion of protected area coverage to at, le at least 17% of ter ter terrestrial and inland water areas and 10% of coastal and marine areas by 2020. This further underlines the importance that states and conservation organizations implement measures to recognize the rights of indigenous peoples as a matter of priority. At the global level, protected areas policy is shaped by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Since 2003, IUCN has committed to promote that all protected areas be managed with the participation of indigenous representatives in compliance with the rights of indigenous peoples and that mechanisms be established for the restitution of indigenous people's traditional lands and territories that were incorporated in protected areas without their free and informed consent. The majority of the large conservation organizations have adopted specific policies on indigenous people's rights and several have developed specific guidelines on how to implement free prior informed consent in their projects. However, these policies have been slow in transferring from paper to practice. In view of the powerful position conservation organizations hold vis-a-vis -vis authorities in countries with weak rule of law, 
I call on conservation organizations to use their leverage more affirmatively in order to influence national authorities and advocate for legal and policy shifts in countries which still fail to recognize indigenous people's rights, notably by supporting legislative reform, the application of free prior informed consent, and the restitution of ancestral lands of indigenous peoples. Furthermore, conservation organizations should ensure that indigenous peoples participate equally in the management of protected areas and that all conservation measures include continuous joint monitoring of how they comply with standards protecting indigenous peoples' rights. Deficient national recognition of indigenous peoples' rights continues to be the main obstacle which blocks the important contribution of indigenous peoples in conserving biological diversity and their participation in conservation efforts. I urge states to critically review their policy and legislative framework for the full recognition of the rights in, of indigenous peoples over their lands, territories, and resources as enshrined in international human rights law. Protected areas often overlap with World Heritage Sites and have, in numerous instances, been declared without consultation with indigenous peoples with subsequent serious negative impact upon their rights. I urge UNESCO to ensure that respect for indigenous peoples' right to free prior and informed consent is obtained prior to World Heritage listing of protected sites. Madam Chair, in conclusion, rights-based conservation measures continue to be hampered by the legacy of past violations and by the lack of recognition by states of indigenous peoples' rights. Conservation organizations and indigenous organizations could be powerful allies in their mutually sh shared goals to safeguard biodiversity and protect nature from external threats such as unsustainable resource exploitation. Protected areas continue to expand, yet threats against them from extractive industry, agribusiness, energy and infrastructure projects are also increasing, and thus the urgency to address effective collaborative and long-term conservation is of paramount importance. The escalating incidence of killings of indigenous environmentalists further underlines the urgency that conservationists and indigenous people join forces to protect land and biodiversity from external threats. I had the privilege of being invited to present this report before the IUC and World Conservation Congress, which was held in Hawaii in September this year. I welcome the news from IUC and that important resolutions were adopted by the Congress, which took into account some of the recommendations I made in my report including on the need for safeguarding indigenous lands, territories, and resources from unsustainable developments by encouraging that governments work with indigenous peoples to create, inst create institute, and enforce legal and management regimes and to enhance accountability and improve governance in order to avoid, avoid interventions that negatively impact on the rights of indigenous peoples. Further resolutions were adopted recognizing the overlap between protected areas and territories conserved by indigenous peoples and local communities and on improving the participation of in indigenous organizations in the structures of the, U of the IUCN. I briefly wish to refer to the thematic I presented to the Human Rights Council last month, which was the second of three reports that I will dedicate to international investment agreements and their impacts on indigenous peoples' rights. Last year, my report to the General Assembly sought to address the impact of the international investment regime in the con context of indigenous peoples' rights. My report to the Human Rights Council this year further contextualizes and analyzes these impacts and presents a number of recommendations aimed at guiding member states, the UN system, and actors involved in the international investment law regime. My report seeks to promote coherence across international investment law and international human rights law and ensure that the responsibility of states pertaining to the rights of indigenous peoples is not obstructed by protections afforded to investors.
I believe it is possible to reform and develop a system of international investment law that reduces risk to indigenous people's rights and serves to benefit both them and the state while providing investment security to foreign investors. This requires the establishment of regulatory frameworks and enforcement mechanisms to ensure that investors' practices are consistent and comply with international human rights standards pertaining to indigenous peoples' rights. I wish to take this opportunity, opportunity to note that my third and final report relating to international investment, investment agreements will be presented to the Human Rights Council this year. It will consider how human rights and sustainable development approaches can contribute to shaping the future of investments in or near indigenous people's territories so that they serve to benefit all in a just and equitable manner. In my thematic report to the General Assembly next year, I will be following up on discussions in the permanent forum this year, explore how armed conflict, peace agreements, and transitional justice impact on human rights on, of indigenous peoples, and in particular on their right to truth, justice, and reparation. Among other thematic priority areas, I will continue to monitor closely the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Indigenous peoples make up 5% of the global population, yet account for 15% of the world's poorest peoples. While I note as positive the re references to indigenous peoples in the SDG indicators relating to agricultural productivity, education, and in the need for national progress reviews, I regret that the SDGs did not include additional references to indigenous peoples among its goals and target indicators. I wish to recall that I urge for such inclusion and for the need for this aggregated data in order to monitor development progress in my report to the General Assembly in 2014. As the coming year will mark the 10th anniversary of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, I will continue to pay particular attention to the application of its wide-ranging provisions as a matter of priority. Closing the gap between recognition of indigenous peoples' rights at the international level and the actual implementation on the ground remains my main preoccupation and I re reiterate my commitment in my role as Special Rapporteur to monitor closely how states and the United Nations are implementing the declaration and the outcome document of the World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. Since I spoke here in, ge in the General Assembly, I have conducted three official country visits to SAPNI, Finland, Norway, and Sweden in August 2015, Honduras in November 2015, in Brazil in March 2016. I reported on these visits to the Human Rights Council last month and will therefore only make brief mention of this. During my visit to SAPMI, I observed that increased drive to mineral extraction and the development of renewable energy projects in SAPMI was one of the main threats against the realization of the rights of the Sami people. In Honduras, I witnessed the lack of full recognition, protection, of, and enjoyment of indigenous peoples' rights to ancestral lands and natural resources in a fund, is a fundamental problem, as is impunity for the increasing violence against indigenous peoples. During my visit, I met with Berta Cáceres, an indigenous Lenca activist who was killed four months later on March 3, 2016, because of her protest against the Agwasarka Dam, even though she had been awarded precautionary protection measures from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. I will continue to monitor the investigations into Ms. Casares' murder and urge the state to hold the perpetrators accountable and break the vicious cycle of impunity. In Brazil, I noted the convergence of various disconcerting developments that further entrench the interests and power of the economic and political elite to the detriment of the rights of indigenous peoples. I deeply regret that since my visit, killings and violent evictions of the Kayowa Guarani peoples in Mato Grosso, some of which I visited, continue to, to take place. 
I also regret that many of the promises to the indigenous peoples displaced by the Belo Monte Dam are still to be implemented. I am pleased, however, to learn that the Tapajos Dam project has been canceled, which has been a long-standing demand of the Munduruko and other indigenous peoples living in that territory. The demarcation of the indigenous peoples' lands in Cachoeira Seca is another good development. Next year, I will be conducting country visits to Australia, Guatemala, and possibly Chile and Cameroon. I wish to thank countries in Latin America, in the Pacific, and in Africa who have invited me to do a country visit. Before I end my report, I would like to mention the promotion of good practices, as I have continued to provide technical assistance to governments in their efforts to develop laws and policies that relate to indigenous peoples. Allow me to highlight a few examples. During the Paris Conference of Parties of the UNFCCC in December 2015, I, together with the OHCHR and the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Environment, advocated for the inclusion of human rights, language which recognizes the need to address human rights, including indigenous people's rights in all climate change measures, and this was included in the Paris Agreement. In February 2016, I participated in the high-level dialogue on the World Bank draft environmental and social standards on indigenous peoples in Addis Ababa, which centered on the use of the term indigenous peoples and the requirement to obtain their free prior and informed consent. Together with the chairs of Permanent Forum and the Expert Mechanism on Indigenous Peoples, uh, it, we subsequently wrote a joint letter to the World Bank to express concerns regarding the weakening of the safeguards with proposals for remedial language. I will continue to engage with the World Bank on safeguards for indigenous peoples. I have prioritized and significantly increased the number of communications addressed to governments in relation to allegations of violations of indigenous peoples' rights. Since the beginning of this year, I have sent over 50 communications to more than 30 states in relation to violations of a wide range of economic, social, and cultural, as well as civil and political rights. The failure to ensure free prior informed consent of indigenous peoples before undertaking measures and projects affecting their lands territories and other resources remains a key recurring concern. I would like to thank all the states that have responded to communications. Madam Chair, to conclude my presentation, I wish to reaffirm my commitment to promoting indigenous people's rights in close co collaboration with indigenous peoples themselves and in coordination with relevant international mechanisms and institutions, notably the Permanent Forum, the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and treaty bodies. I seek to contribute to ensuring that indigenous people's voices are effectively heard and to facilitate dialogue between indigenous peoples, governments, and other re relevant actors involved in specific situations across the world in which indigenous people's rights are not being respected. I reiterate my pledge to address the human rights challenges brought to my attention and to be proactive in efforts to prevent such situations from arising or escalating. I thank you all for your attention and look forward to our discussion.